Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. We know your time is uh, precious, and we really appreciate that you've chosen to spend uh, your time on yet another web meeting. My name is Scott Campbell. I'm the head of GIS Technology for Eagle, and Eagle, for those of you who don't know, um, don't know us, we represent Esri Technology in New Zealand and the South Pacific. We've been asked here this morning by SAG, uh, to co-present a topic which is in itself about bringing information and systems and people together. And today we want to do this through the lens of a utility organization. So the idea of geo-enabling or bringing geographic location to enterprise systems um, is not new to utilities, but what is new is the latest joint work that's been done by Esri and their alliance partner, SAP. So to make this integration work both easier with a number of technology options and also more valuable, uh, bringing GIS capabilities and data into the heart of ERP and also making the valuable ERP data accessible through GIS. So it's a two-way exchange of capabilities and information. What's also very new is that I'm excited to say that ZAG are Esri's uh, pretty much their newest partner, definitely the newest partner in New Zealand. And that's as of uh, last week. So ZAG are now an Esri partner, uh, making them unique in New Zealand by having both Esri and SAP practices in-house. So to take you through this topic, we're drawing upon a good depth of experience. I'm joined by some colleagues who many of you already know. Uh, firstly, Barry Hodges, a data platform architect from SAP and also uh, Matthew Sekula, the head of spatial at ZAG itself. Uh, I've known both of these chaps for many years and uh, working together in the area we're about to talk to you uh, on today, um, the powerful combination of ERP and GIS. And hopefully, as you will see uh, this morning, this is an area which just like Matty, uh, Barry and myself has matured a great deal over that time. Next slide there, please. So um, what we want to cover today, um, we're combining the ESRI's GIS and SAP's ERP technology. Um, and so we wanted to share with you the latest developments, the key benefits and some real world examples from New Zealand and globally. But we also recognize that today's audience comes from across the spectrum of exposure to both of these technologies. And so we wanted to take a, a few minutes up front to cover off the basics of both ESRI's GIS and SAP's ERP. So we apologize that this is possibly covering off ground with which some of you are already familiar, but we did want to make sure we cater for the different backgrounds and levels of technology familiarity, um, as well as providing a bit of a recap or update for, for others there. So as I mentioned, I think in the before we started, we are planning to have time for questions uh, at the end. So please send through any questions in the Q&A uh, panel at the bottom of your screen, and we'll go through those at the end. Um, and also, as I mentioned, there'll be a copy of the slides that we're showing today um, sent out, as well as some more supporting detail that we haven't got time to show today um, to all attendees. So you don't need to frantically take, take notes. We will send the, the slides out to everyone. Next slide, please. So just, we're all, just so we're all on the same page, um, let me give you some background on the GIS side of things. So computers are about making, uh, often are about making a digital representation of what exists in the real world, whether it's money, people, buildings, weather, social connections, workflows, processes, or assets. A GIS is centered upon a digital representation of things which exist in the real world and which can be represented spatially using location. Everything from human and physical geography to people, assets, jobs, operational boundaries, weather information, live road status, everything. Every data set to us is a layer or a group of layers which come together to make a map. So these digital maps, just like their paper versions, are used to answer questions. And the questions which you have will determine which of these layers are to be included. You can think of each map as an individual information product supporting different use cases, but which often have shared layers of data. We'll come onto the sources of data for these layers shortly, but of course, having layers driven from some of your organization's most valuable information, including both your GIS and your ERP, allows you to represent the entities in the real world, as well as to fully model the business processes and as a single workflow or a transaction, rather, like, rather than as a separate information silos, which can often be the case. 
So I think that this uh, combination personally opens up a whole range of, of possibilities. So once you've modeled your data, um, bringing it from both the ERP and the GIS to model the real world assets, workflows, et cetera, then you can add in analytics. So this is going beyond simply visualizing the data and using the real power of computing to understand the interrelationships, the patterns and the trends in these layers of data. Data which is connected by nothing other than its location. We now know, however, that in the real world, location is a very important element in understanding cause and effect, demand and supply, and understanding behavior over space and time. Next slide, please. So GIS can be applied in many different ways. And below, we've summarized the main patterns of use which we've seen locally and globally. And hopefully you can apply these to your own organization. And we've seen these applied to utilities across New Zealand. The first and probably simplest one is mapping and visualization, bringing together all those layers of information and allowing your very powerful brain to do the hard work of understanding what that means. Sometimes just seeing data on a map is one of the most powerful things you can do. In order to do this mapping effectively, there needs to be a highly efficient means of storing and accessing such data. And that's where data management comes in, allowing the retrieval of just the information needed to answer the question, selecting just that area of data from a national or global data set. For an enterprise, ideally this is a single source of truth. And SAP's HANA is set up to store this in a native spatial form inside a HANA geodatabase. Field mobility is the biggest growth that I've seen in the, couple, in the number of professional GS users in the last couple of years. And it's been the area of uh, growth across New Zealand, especially in the utility uh, and sector and other areas where it's very operationally focused. So using apps such as ArcGIS Collector to take data into and out of the field, both online and offline. So whether you're tracking your field crews for health and safety or COVID contact tracing, assigning and tracking job status, as part of a work order management process, or using the apps for rapid online and offline field inspections. That's what field mobility is about. And we recently saw the rapid deployment of this capability to over a thousand field crew over a couple of days to support health and safety, specifically for COVID tracking in, in New Zealand. Many New Zealand organizations are using ArcGIS to monitor information in real time from various live sources, IoT sensors, SCADA systems, live weather feeds, data coming from staff in the field with apps, or even publicly reported information. Collectively, this monitoring allows live GIS layers to be brought into the core, into the core enterprise data stores and used, for example, for alerting and analysis. Increasingly here in New Zealand, we have a, we have a plug and play capability for ingesting such IoT sources. So not all of them, but most of them we can bring in quite easily. Going beyond that is analytics. So it's about going beyond the mapping and going deeper into understanding the patterns, trends and underlying connections in your data, all surfaced through location. We'll come back to that one um, shortly, actually. Specific tools have been designed on top of ArcGIS to allow the design and planning of everything from a wastewater or electric network for a suburb or subdivision up to fiber design for an entire region. This design pattern is particularly powerful when combined with analytics to understand the behavior of a proposed design under different scenarios. How will my assets perform given different conditions? What will the impact of a council rezoning be on my existing network? Next pattern we see a lot of is decision support. So recently through the response to COVID-19, we've seen organizations bringing together data layers and other live feeds in simple dashboards to allow decision makers to quickly see the, the key derived metrics and how they relate to specific locations. This mirrors the use we've seen over the past four or five years um, using dashboards for real-time views of assets and their performance. Uh, for example, in the case of incidents, how does, uh, impact, how does an impact on a lifeline asset, uh, how can it be visualized simply for uh, decision makers to see? The last two are about taking information and making it more widely available. The first being constituent engagement. So an area we've seen again around COVID using public facing websites and dashboards to share information publicly as an authoritative source to avoid uh, media organizations picking up the wrong information dashboards are being put out. And we're seeing this um, in the case of utilities where uh, organizations want to put out public outage maps so that people can see what the current status of all outages is and perhaps saving a phone call. 
And the last one is sharing and collaboration. So we talked about breaking down silos securely and securely sharing GIS layers between teams, departments, organizations, and between regions. And this sharing and collaboration pattern is key to that. Here in New Zealand, we're seeing a great deal of this being used between organizations collaborating, for example, on a specific initiative, whether that's responding to a local emergency where lines companies, councils, road owners, such as NZTA and, and local road owners, um, are bringing in weather sources, all to be shared securely and making a real difference to how quickly and effectively each of these organizations can, can respond. So I mentioned in the previous slide spatial analytics, and we don't just think of it as a, as a pattern um, uh, in itself. There's so much complexity in there that actually, and it's due to its broad application, it's almost its own language. So at its heart, spatial analytics forms a set of sophisticated algorithms designed to make the most of the computer processing and large, potentially complex data sets. There are hundreds of different algorithms that can be run, but these can be broadly grouped by the types of questions they're aimed at answering. From the simple questions, such as where is something located? Where are my assets? Where are my outages? Where are my customers? Where is the heavy rain? Through to the tasks that identify patterns or relationships between data points or data sets. Where are my network vulnerabilities? Where are the key fact, what are the key factors which lead to an asset failure? Then onto such relationships, um, onto those using relationships to identify optimal use of resources or to predicting the future state or outcomes. What is the likely outcome for this action? An exciting development here in New Zealand for this last one is we're seeing New Zealand utilities taking in live weather feeds as a GIS layer uh, and also a forecast um, and using analytics to understand the likely impact on their network at an asset by asset level. With that example, um, there are significant opportunities I'm sure you can see in combining those analytics with the valuable ERP data that will come on to shortly. So with all of these capabilities, in terms of a utility, um, we focused on meeting five key needs of a modern utility. And these can be summarized um, here. Firstly, keeping your staff and your public safe. Secondly, connecting with and supporting your customers. Thirdly, connecting uh, IT systems such as GIS with your operational technology, making SCADA information um, a, a, an extra layer inside your GIS. And providing the support for innovation for and future proofing. Um, we've seen a lot of interest in the last few months around using existing capabilities and repurposing those to meet uh, uh, the needs of the COVID response and having uh, an easy to configure underlying GIS framework has been key to that. Next slide, thank you. So a key part of all of this from Esri's perspective is the utility network technology. This is the new generation of network modeling from Esri which now supports the HANA G database, which is pretty exciting. It's a technology framework which is built to support all utility industry verticals and we've already been working with our existing users for the past two to three years in the electric, in the electric industry and also local government users who are managing our three waters to migrate to this utility network from their previous network management solutions. Certainly traditional maps will always have a, play, a, key, play, a key role to play in utility products but having the ability to generate schematics as a derived product has generated tremendous amounts of excitement across utilities. Very large scale facilities such as pump stations or substations are now attainable using features such as containment associations, which provides an improved user experience for working with engineering internals at all scales and resolutions. With higher precision data comes the ability to have sharper analytics across the data and explore the time dimension to see the impact of historical operations or sandbox future requirements or plans. And the integration of Z or height or elevation values in ArcGIS allows us to operate in the 3D space, which has been one of the more exciting features for utilities. And we've seen a lot of interest in that in the last little while. So a key point here though, is that in New Zealand, we're seeing the adoption of this utility network taking place in parallel with utilities taking advantage of the other patterns we spoke about, taking advantage of field apps, analytics, and data sharing patterns. So those are capabilities which can be taken up and deployed rapidly, rapidly independent of this utility network migration, but which of course will take advantage of the utility network when that is in place. 
Powering all of these capabilities is a combination of data layers, as we mentioned. And traditionally, these data layers were representing your own enterprise information, both from the GEO database, our ArcGIS data store, and from the wider enterprise systems such as SAP ERP information. However, recently there's been an explosion in other ready-to-use information sources such as web services. These include securely shared layers representing data from other organizations and layers representing publicly available authoritative data that you can just bring in to your system and use as if they were your own. This last group is an amazing resource and Eagle have been working hard here with the New Zealand government and other sources to provide over 70 New Zealand specific layers ranging from high resolution imagery to geology and from census data to elevation. We call all of this the Living Atlas and it's curated by us but populated using authoritative public data as well as some private sources like organisations you represent. So finally, the capabilities and analytics we looked at uh, just now are combined with public, private, and enterprise data to provide configurable apps. These apps are the things that the end users actually take advantage of. And these are used by a whole range of utility organizations across New Zealand and the globe right now. They're designed to be configured and deployed to meet the various needs of the organization's workforce and stakeholders. As such, they range from desktop apps for the GIS professionals to the smartphone apps for field workers or contractors and web applications for analysts or planners. They connect with the C-suite through data-driven live dashboards and engage public audiences with web apps for two-way trusted crowdsourcing as well as open data and open insights initiatives. It's really about the right tool for the right person or job, all connected though to the same core sources of data. So you'll see how these apps complement those of SAP shortly, as well as how they can be integrated to create a seamless flow of information um, across your organization. And so on that note, I'd like to pass over to SAP's Barry Hodges to take us through what is an ERP and how does that relate to Geospatial? Thanks, Scott. Uh, great uh, overview of GIS, especially for those of us that work in the ERP space and perhaps aren't so familiar with GIS. You know, look, in my job, I frequently get asked about how do we bring data together? It, it's the most common question I get asked is, you know, we've got data in SAP. We think that it would be valuable if we brought it in context of other data sets and frequently those other data sets are GIS systems. And uh, I think we're starting to see a lot of the obvious reasons why. But look, I, I thought it would be appropriate to get everyone on the same page in terms of what ERP is, because of course, uh, we have assumptions around what ERP is, but it's always helpful to just level set on that just for the benefit of uh, what we'll talk about after this piece around bringing these two worlds together. So in, in that regard, uh, you know, if you know a lot about your organization uh, in the sense that uh, how it operates, the different teams that work together to deliver the business outcomes, then you'll know a lot about what an ERP system is all about. I mean, you're aware of the finance team You've got a team in there that are required to look after procurement. You've got the HR team. And of course, from a front office point of view, those that directly deal with customers and of course go out in the field and work on equipment and so on. And if you think about uh, the way that the GIS system is ultimately digitizing the physical world, I suppose the ERP systems are there to digitize business processes that sort of flow across these different domains. And at the end of the day, uh, an ERP is a digital twin, I guess, of your business processes. Uh, and as I kind of alluded to just a moment ago, it is often missing one of the more important ingredients or dimensions, and that is the where. Because ERP is digitizing real world events, which frequently not only have a, a time value associated with them and also obviously a financial or customer dimension, but there is a physical location there as well. So. We're here to try and just cover off that, you know, how do we bring these worlds together? Because there's massive value, whether you're in the business of GIS wanting to see business data in that context or the inverse, you're a business person and wanting to know uh, some of the information about the physical uh, where of where this event has happened. But on the screen here, I've kind of distilled down how I describe ERP in one sentence as best as I can. And it's all about optimizing the flow of information, materials and cash. And, and what I'll do is hopefully unpack this a little bit more uh, in the next two or three slides, but that would be the way I would describe an ERP system to, to somebody who was asking me in, in as few words as possible. So we can go to the next slide. 
Uh, let's have a look at uh, an ERP system from a fairly practical point of view. Of course, customers exist out there and as a utility, uh, your role is to provide them uh, services, be it supply of electricity, water, uh, what, what is the, the, the commodity that is being brought to them that they need. Now, to get that service up and going, you have to effectively build your product. So you have to assemble materials. Now, those materials could be the physical generation equipment, uh, or you could be receiving uh, raw ingredient in terms of power or water from a, another distributor. But the point being is that you assemble those as a commodity that is then able to be on sold. So that turns up in your inventory. And when things turn up in your inventory, it has therefore got some monetary value and therefore it ends up in your general ledger as well. So you supply the product and the customer is invoiced and that customer is obviously gonna be down to uh, how the relationship with the end customer is set up. It might be actually through some proxy. But the point is there is a process here that requires us to integrate different data sets in, in an orchestrated manner. So that, that to me is how I would describe it more at a, at a business process level. So if we go to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about SAPs. This is a, a slide that SAP has presented uh, fairly recently in terms of describing the entire SAP uh, breadth of capability. And the reason we're putting this on here is you're probably familiar with those operational side aspects of SAP, the finance systems, the supply chain procurement and so forth. That's what we've been known for for a very long time. Uh, but in addition to that, we also now are measuring experience and trying to understand the, the services that we're providing actually effective. So on that side of the house, we have brought in some tools to help us understand what exactly is going on in terms of the those that interface, interface with the various business systems that we run inside those ERPs. And in the middle is the glue. It's essentially the technology services that bring these worlds together. And that would be potentially between the customer and finance systems, uh, the network management systems, the asset management systems and so forth, both from a, a physical plumbing and also some of the key things around data and analytics, of course, GIS is now a, a topic that we are now essentially tapping into here when we start to look at what actually is beneath the covers of that integration stack, that intelligence stack in the middle. So we'll go to the next slide and we'll have a look at a few examples. Depending on whether you're a person that sits in the ERP side of the world or whether you're a, a, a person sitting inside the GIS side of the world, you know, there are a number of applications available and it depends on the persona that is going to be using and accessing data. Uh, you might be out in the field and in that regard, you need some mobility services. And in this regard, what we're trying to do is bring together in that mobile device, not just the spatial information about the where, but also the business context of what you're there for. So it could be asset information that's important to be looking at when you're physically moving through the real world. So we've got these mobile capabilities where we expose these two worlds together. Uh, from an analysis point of view, in your planning job, again, this is very much a case of having access to as much data as possible. And Scott talked about a lot of good use cases and examples around asset management and so forth, where we are planning forward what is going to happen and where do we need to deploy our resources. So again, that's very much a case of predicting, but using both spatial and business data in the same context. So the glue at the bottom there is really the key on this slide there, that we need a way to synchronize these two worlds, the, the traditional data set held in the geodatabase and the data set that represents the business operations held in, in our case, if it's an SAP domain in the business suite. What are the synchronization options? And, and Marty's going to go into a bit more detail on what those look like. But the point here is I get asked over and over, how do we bring these two worlds together in a more agile and integrated way? So if we can go to the next slide, look at a little bit of uh, some use cases that, that we see typically uh, coming to the fore. And, and again, Marty's going to talk about some actual customer examples, but from a utilities point of view, and this is repeating much of what Scott talked about, the predominant space is around asset maintenance. And I've seen some really cool examples where 
uh, we have built digital twins of generation assets and monitor them effectively in real life and using advanced analytics, which requires us to bring in asset master information and match it up with the IoT flow to know exactly what is likely to happen in the short, medium and long term with that asset. But again, that's mine. also where physically that asset is in the field and what is the environment in which it is exposed. I talked about in the previous slide, field workers who are out looking at maintaining assets. Again, it's about bringing the business data into the same forum as the spatial information as they physically move around the real world. And just knowing where in the world you are in relation to the assets that you have. So that is also a key one. But it doesn't matter where you are, it depends on, of course, what industry you're in. But the context here is around those utility type organizations that very much are very asset uh, centric. And also your customers, where's your demand coming from? What's your inflows? Are you able to support them through these different scenarios and those modeling cases, which often require us to bring into line financial models to understand this information as well. If we can go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about SAP's relationship with ESRI over the last best part of 20 years now. Uh, it started in the early, in late 90s with the, uh, the exposure of our analytics capabilities in a GIS spatial context. So bringing the SAP Business Warehouse and ESRI together. And over the years, as you can see here, there's been a lot of complementary co-development work going on to make the integrations happen at every level of SAP's technology stacks. Uh, and this is about putting mapping information, and not just mapping, but also the smarts behind GIS into our analytical tools. And also be able to take the business data out of SAP and push it through into the GIS platform as well. So it's a bi-directional relationship. But the most recent innovations have predominantly focused on pushing that insight into the data layer. It's our belief that the closer to the data you can push the analytics, the more accessible that information is to more people because you have pushed it right down to where the data sits. And that gives us massive advantages around pivoting off that one data layer to do many use cases without having to create multiple copies of the same data. So we're looking at really focusing on making these integrations really, really tight. So as you can see on the right there, uh, the partnership has uh, matured quite well in the sense that we now recognize ESRI as one of our key partners and the ongoing innovation hasn't stopped with the latest innovation there, which is to push the geodatabase capabilities straight into the SAP HANA database, which for SAP happens to be the exact same platform on which we are running all of our business applications. So let's just have a wee bit of a look at the technical detail before I hand over to Marty. So we can go to the next slide. What we are showing there at the bottom, and HANA comes up over and over, and that's for the simple reason that I was talking about before. We really want to centralize the spatial information and the business information in one place. And HANA's got this capability to do what we call multimodal analytics. So we can do spatial analysis at the same time as we're running the transaction processing and analytical processing. And if you think about a lot of the types of things that you're going to do with data, they never are just spatial. They're never just transaction processing. They are a concert of these processes. So if we've got one platform that can manage all of this data concurrently, then we've got some massive advantages in terms of the use cases we can run. If you see at the top there, not only are we able to run SAP applications, but also ESRI can run natively on the same platform. And in that regard, we are essentially saying that all the data in SAP is available to ESRI, and ESRI as a service layer can now take that data and render it, the business data, in a spatial context. And to give you one final example before I hand over to Mati, we go to the next slide, I'll just take you through a, an example of a customer we were working with in North America who was a utility and they had lines that were needing to make sure vegetation wasn't getting too close to. So they were using a combination of video, so drone footage, knowing physically where the asset was in terms of the GIS system, pinpointing the X, Y coordinate of the object. And then the asset information, of course, stored in SAP. So that, that was our data set, but we were having to then bring all this data together and do some advanced analytics to work out what was the optimal maintenance plan in terms of that vegetation clearing. 
and using as much as possible automation as opposed to the more traditional manual processes that have been used in the past, where it might be based on a, a scheduled date that we would visit this location. We're actually being much more digital in the way we're trying to do things. And that's really the goal here with all of this, is to digitize these processes, not have the manual processes, not have to wait for data to be sent from one system to the other and reassembled. We're really trying to close the gaps. Our innovation curve extremely accelerates. So I've talked a bit about the benefits, I think, of bringing these data sets here, and hopefully you've got an understanding of what ERP is. I'll hand over now to Marty, who will take us through some customer examples and a bit more of the how and the technical detail. Thanks, Marty. She will just, if you go to the next slide, and I'll let Marty take over. Thanks. Thanks, Barry. Uh, so yeah, so my name is Matti Seikko. I'm uh, head of Spatial in, in ZAG. Uh, reasonably new team. Uh, we started on July the 1st, but um, very experienced team. So our people are, uh, our, our team is, everybody is 15 to 20 years of Spatial expertise. Um, and then getting our heads around the SAP space as well. Um, Looking at some of, starting with some of the examples here, these are global examples on utilities sector and, and what's happening there. Uh, anything from electricity utility to water networks to road networks, um, things like uh, around the customer safety and health and safety is a much more big thing happening right now. Everybody's following that, coming up with mandates and, and legal uh, legislation on how that's done. Uh, vegetation management, like Barry um, mentioned, is an important part. Uh, Scott mentioned uh, um, some of the utilities here looking at the real live weather forecasts and how lightning strikes might be affecting your cables and things like that. Uh, saving money by not having to send people to constantly go and check the uh, utilities assets on the on the field things like that uh, pipeline maintenance etc so I'm not going to go through this in great detail but there are on this slide stack um, there are basically play on three of these examples here which you can press and then launch a video which uh, which tells you a little bit more about what that specific customer does next slide please a um, couple of other ones are a little bit more kind of outside that, so ports like port logistics and, and how that affects uh, um, potentially the utilities areas, um, airlines, uh, air traffic, things like that. So there's a whole lot of different uh, utilities, network type of entities there. This is more around the transport, but network is kind of similar type of um, segmentation rules and, and, and topology rules apply there. On the right hand side is a couple of things we've been playing with. So um, we, we've worked with PowerCo for a long time, um, building SAP and ESRI um, based systems there. Eastland Group is a, is a new, newer customer of ours, where we're actually now implementing the ESRI's utility network uh, model. And integrating SAP and ESRI closely together there to um, give the, give Eastern Group the best of both worlds um, type of scenario there. This then eventually will potentially lead up to things like augmented reality, artificial intelligence. Uh, we have a, a field product there called Blueworks, which allows us to look at the assets on the ground um, so a lot of things happening on this space. Next slide, please. And, and if you look at New Zealand and, and a little bit Australia so specifically, um, there's a couple of customers here who are a utility, uh, or deal with utility networks, um, typically have SRE in-house um, um, and, and typically have SAP in-house. So, so a lot of these are potential where we can actually start integrating SAP and SV clo more closely together uh, and, and start using the you know, power of one source of truth and power of the GIS within SAP and the business data from SAP within GIS. Next slide, please. 
So on the team, what does this mean? So Zach has been uh, an SAP gold partner for a long time. Uh, I think he started in 96. Um, so we have a whole bunch of different teams, technologists and team and e-commerce team who are specialists on integrating and developing things, analytics team, uh, product development team. We have a cloud and basis team who set up things and a testing team. So we've set up a brand new spatial team there who, who are specialists on spatial ESRI specifically and, and how that can be integrated into the systems. The core team uh, is cross-skilling then to the other teams. So we basically, on these other teams there, technologies and e-commerce team are currently getting four people trained and certified to ESRI. Cloud team and basis team are just yesterday, we've discussed it through, we're going to get four people there certified, certified to ESRI as well. So our current core uh, spatial team is only five people, but we have already 10 people in the other teams there cross-skilled and, and being able to do spatial and necessary. So this way we can make sure that we can cover SAP skills and the ESRI skills across the board and, and come up with the best possible solution for our customers. Next slide, please. So looking at that, how, how these things work together. So like, like Barry said, this works by looking at a left hand and the right hand side. So on the left, on the left hand side, we will have what, what SAP currently has in place. So click, click once, please. And there's already a lot of SAP products that are that are enabling ESRI and the power of spatial into the systems there. SAP especially when with the later versions we are we are now fully fully in the web we are fully in the cloud and that actually enables us to use all the CIS functionality there a lot easier because CIS in web is enabled and integrated exactly the same way like all the web technology is there's no proprietary um, frameworks in there specific for CIS click again please and in SAP world, we, we have the, the, the little blue boxes there. Those are the ones that actually enable all this stuff. Pick once more. On the right hand side, then we have what GIS tools provide for us. So ESRI tools allow us to view and do a much more sophisticated and advanced analytics and reporting, querying, um, monitoring using the spatial entities. Uh, using the blue boxes on the right hand side which are ESRI's way of integrating these things. But, the, but these two environments, SAP and ESRI working together, means that the GIS tools can access the same data that SAP is storing. So we get one source of truth across the board. Now, if you're using HANA there, that means that we can actually have one database which does both SAP and ESRI as an ESRI geo database and allows us to, to, to really easily merge it together. But that is not an abs absolute must. So we have a lot of customers who, who have a HANA database there for, for, for the business use and then a, a se separate ESRI um, database there, which, which could be something else. Um, and, and that can then be used as a sidecar pattern there to allow us to still do that, separating it into the web services tier rather than doing it directly in the database. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at this a little bit more in detail, um, we start with, a, with, with, the, with the spatial database that we have in place there, the HANA there. We can bring data from a whole variety of, of systems. So this is from other spatial databases or non-spatial databases like Oracles and DP2s and SQL servers, or from a whole variety of CIS vendor systems um, like Nokia's here and, and, and OneSpace and all of the different ones, Google data, open source or open source databases like PostGIS uh, or open source tools like Q uh, QGIS Leaflet, frameworks, things like that. Click again, please. 
we can then use ESRI to take that data and publish it into a whole lot of different um, ESRI tools. So this could be mobile field apps that ESRI provides or the self-service tools that are part of the ESRI framework or, or some location aware trends and insight tools that ESRI provides. Click again. Or they uh, take the data from the SAP side of the fence um, and data and services like geocoding and navigating, which is provided as part of the directories there, or searching and validating, which are part of the um, directories as well. And then the SAP HANA spatial services, which is what I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Next, please. Once more. Okay. So we have two, two lots of um, services and APIs available in, in SAP Swift. The first one is the HANA Spatial Services. So currently these are the services that are available um, out of the box inside uh, HANA. What's, what makes these special is these are, like if you take the Wildfire API there, this is a real, real time um, API that allows us to put a wildfire layer into a map, but which is updated constantly. So like when the Australia wildfires were happening, this API, you could you could send a query to it and say, give me the latest changes to the wildfires in a certain area. And then that would give us a layer that we could toggle on, which is, which is live and showing you the latest changes happening constantly. Or take the weather API, like, like um, Scott was talking about on his presentation, whether it's lightning or temp temperatures or wind or rain or snow or whatever it is, real-time layer in the map that allows us to see the information um, con in the context of your core data, your reference data. Surface API is about seeing vegetation growth. So that's not real time, that's once a day type of updated thing. So it will show you where vegetation is growing. Earth Observation API is about the contour of land, so you get earthquakes happening, uh, volcanoes happening, things like that, that change the ground. So you can see the changes on the ground again, not real time, but kind of daily updated thing. And a whole bunch of different ones. Click again. Specifically, the two they highlighted inside the yellow box, the model API, the lab labeling tool API, allow us to create our own APIs using your data. So your analysts can, can take your data sets and create with these two tool sets there another API tool, which you could then use internally or open it up for your contractors or your public users or whoever, whoever it is as a layer on the map. Good. Um, and then the directives I, I was mentioning before um, allow us to take, they, they already include the latest New Zealand Post data and land information New Zealand data, specifically on addressing, allowing us to uh, create navigational services or geocoding directories, things like that. So lots of quite powerful web services based tools there uh, already in the SAP suite that will allow us to um, look, at the ta uh, look at the reference data around us and use it for specific purposes, especially the hazard information is becoming quite um, real nowadays, more and more people, uh, I mean, we messed up the weather, so more and more people need to know what's happening and, and these extreme weathers are here to stay. Every year we're gonna get, it's probably gonna get worse. Next one, please. Um, I wa wanted to talk a little bit about GEF. So GEF is, is so to integrate SAP and ESRI together, there are very many ways of doing that. And one of them is GEF, but we get a lot of questions around that. So we've specifically set up a slide that we can talk it through. So if, when you're, when you're in integrating SAP and ESRI together, you need to kind of look at three things. How, what you're actually planning to do there. So if, 
if you're in the creating business processes like uh, asset identifier, workflow logic, uh, things like that, then you're probably best to use G GEF there because that has all the links needed in the SAP side. Really powerful business and work workflow logic there to allow you to, to use all that. If, however, you're integrating UI, specifically on web, um, and then doing more than like like quite comprehensive editing, for example, or notification type of stuff, then the S with JS API is the best bet for that because it has all this built-in functionality available there for us to just tap in and out of the box, enable redlining and, and other analytical tools. Or if you are synchron needing to synchronize data between spatial and non-spatial database, which happens especially when you have a sidecar scenario. So if, if everything is on HANA, you don't really need to do that at all. Uh, it's already all in one place. But if you're having a HANA database for your SAP data and you're having um, an SQL server database or Oracle or RDP2 or whatever it happens, Postgres, whatever it happens to be there for the CO data, then you need to synchronize some of the data together. And then for that, we, we propose that you either use the uh, S3 interoperability tools, uh, maybe some Python scripts, or, or a tool called FME, which is used for a lot of these things. Now, note, though, that for all three of these, you could use, use GEF as well. Um, but we are finding it easier to kind of separate this out a bit. Next, next please. So, summarizing that one up, um, you use GEF when, if you don't have SRE licensing, you have to use GEF, absolutely, because that's how you enable your mapping. Um, if you need to integrate mapping with SAP products that are other than web browser UI, so, and legacy kind of things, then you'd use GEF. Uh, if you need to have a really complicated workforce or business processes, you use GEF for that. Uh, you use JavaScript API, um, well, if you have an S3 enterprise license, why, why not? Um, you need to be using latest versions of SAP and SAP because those tend to be the web ones. They're the products tend to be web UI products, so that makes it easier to in integrate the S3 JS API. If, if, your web, if you're using web browser UI on your SAP products, then um, JS API is the easiest one to use, and ETL processes, you'd want to basically use the FME type of tools or, or APIs from ESRI for that. Uh, the last one is advanced web capability, 2D, 3D specifically. Uh, 3D is not supported by GEF yet. HANA is. HANA does support 3D, so we can store 3D entities in HANA database. Um, but to view and access them, you'd need to use the JS API. Next, please. So, how can we help you with these things? Uh, there are two different programs going on. Uh, one is about discovering. So this is about discovering how, uh, whether Spatial can do something for you, whether Esri can help your SAP processes there. Um, and, and, and Zach is a local, specialized local partner who can help you on that. So there's a four week program there to discover this thing. This is typically no cost for the customer. SAP, SRI and ourselves will help you kind of do this. Um, second part is if you do know that Spatial can help you and you'd want it to do a bit of a POC proof of concept there to see what it actually does. There's a two to three week pro program there called the, the database migration factory program, which Zach is a partner of, one, the only one in Asia Pacific uh, specializing in spatial. And uh, again, it's a no cost program that customers can uh, sign into and do a bit of a go with seeing how and well, how well the spatial uh, data would migrate with the HANA and the uh, um, HANA space or things like that. Next one, please. On those programs, um, sorry, step back and I'll hand it over to Scott. There's four more slides on those programs. 
in the slide stack, which we will be providing for you. I'm just not going to go through all of that. Um, and then I hand it back to Scott. Thanks very much, Matty, and uh, also to, to Barry. Um, so, so hopefully we've given you a bit of an overview of each of the component technologies um, that we're focusing on today. Um, beyond that, the, for me, the main themes um, can perhaps be summarized in, in these points here. Uh, the first is that we recognize that the silos between technologies are often reflected in the relationships between teams. Um, if you've got siloed information and systems, then the teams themselves and behaviors can also become siloed and you're missing an opportunity there. And so that we think that this, this specific um, combination of technologies and integration patterns that Matty outlined, there's an opportunity to break open those um, silos. We've also seen in New Zealand and overseas that geo-enabling core enterprise data is incredibly valuable uh, and offers some new insights through applying some of the analytics, whether it's simple mapping or more complex spatial analytics. Um, and it gives that geospatial intelligence angle to, to modern utility. Um, we've seen that there are various drivers for SAP ESRI integrations, including looking to um, support better decision making, uh, better model, model the real world, improve safety, we've seen as a driver, and also to increase um, productivity. Um, and finally, in terms of the technology, um, the patterns that Matty went into there mentioned GEF and the JavaScript API. Don't worry if those are new terms uh, to you. There's, there's more supporting information we can give you. Um, but just to, to be clear that, you know, that the SAP and ESRI integration is a, is a co-developed integration um, initiative and that there are various patterns from, from really lightweight, simple integrations to get, the, to get you, perhaps get you started um, through to, to deeper uh, integrations at the data level, um, which, which typically have more benefits, but, but um, there's more work to be done to, to merely get those right. So that was the, the, my perspective on, on some of the, the main points. I'm gonna pass, pass on to Barry just to summarize some of his key takeaways. Thanks, Scott. Look, I'm, I don't think I need to labor what has been said in a sense that the value is well established and I guess the majority of the questions now will be on, you know, what is the business value for doing this for, for your organization and having worked out what that business value is, then what is the best way to, to marry these two worlds together? And end of the day, I think between the three organizations, we have a, a lot of IP on how to do this both in terms of the business value and also the how. And we're keen to support everybody. So well, I think it's just appropriate that we just <clears throat> point out, you know, all of us are here and available. Our contact details are shown here on the, the last slide. Uh, I see we're nearly out of time. So in terms of any questions, I'm not sure if we've got time. I didn't see any coming through the chat. But uh, We don't have any questions yet, so... No questions. Look, what we'll be doing is, as, as Scott said at the start, sharing this slide pack, but we just want to repeat, absolutely keen to, to lean in and help. And it's a common question we, we get asked and very, very much uh, think we've got a good answer for the, for the question. But uh, without questions, maybe that might be a good place to stop unless somebody wants to quickly come off mute and ask a question. That's oh, someone's just jumped yep. in there. Yep, yep. we just get got one. Uh, what is the best way to create new data in both SAP and GIS? That is part of the geometric network without double handling the data. Well, obviously from a HANA point of view, what we attempt to do is if the data sets are in two separate places is we virtualize the data into HANA. So it appears as if, as if it is local. So that being the case, we are only working with the atomic data set and not having to create a secondary copy of the data. Uh, there are other patterns uh, which include co-locating SAP and the ESRI Geo database on the same physical platform. But again, this now is a case by case basis, but there are definitely ways to, to avoid double handling of any data set. Um, and that yeah. comes down to some of the, uh, the lower level technical nuances of the platforms. Yeah, so Barry is absolutely right. If you have all the data in HANA, then this is not an issue at all. So you don't double, double anything, basically. Uh, if you 
if you have a sidecar pattern there, then you have to double something, but typically it would be identifiers and, and some geometry specific data there. You'd still have all your attribute data or most of your attribute data in the uh, SAP side of the fence and, 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 and the geometry data set in the SQL server uh, or the, you know, the uh, sidecar pattern side of the fence. Um, bigger question there is the geometric network is um, actually now ESRI has replaced the geometric network with the utility network. So um, that uh, specific model is no longer in use the same way. So you need, you'd, you'd be better at looking at the utility network for that. Yeah, and so geometric network, just to be clear, the geometric network is used by lots of customers. It's still supported and will be for, for a good long yeah. while. But if you're looking to migrate to the, the, the current generation, and that's where the utility network comes in with all those benefits, for example, being web services based. So, so one of them would be, it would be the integration would be potentially simpler and moving to the utility network. Um, in, uh, question in the integration, is integration seamless with the ERP business suite? Um, we got the latest ERP and ESO in-house. Then yes, absolutely. So you can integrate then straight into the SAP products with some, all the web, web UI based products, you can integrate the ESRI uh, um, interfaces seamlessly. So from a user perspective, you would not know that it's accessing two different product suites. Um, is there synchronous SRI required if ESRI Geo database is inside HANA platform? No. So if your Azure Geo database is inside HANA platform, then you don't need synchronization. Then you we basically, from an Azure perspective, all SAP data can be can be viewed through views uh, directly as feature map and feature services in in uh, and in uh, provided by Azure. Um, how much is FME used in Zach? A lot. Um, we we love FME to bits. Uh, to, to put it into perspective, the interoperability, uh, you, interoper, uh, interops tools in ESRI are also based on FME. They are they are actually a, um, what, what's the word there, uh, Scott? It's a ESRI is licensed the FME and that that's used for the interoperability. Yeah, they're they're OEM within the ArcGIS desktop and server yeah. products, enterprise products. So basically the interface for, for that is exactly the same um, as the, the full on FME. Um, so it is a great tool. Uh, anything else that seems to be, oh yeah, no, there's a lot more. <laughs> Can I have a job please? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's uh, thanks and yeah, that's all good. So if, if you have any other questions, feel free to use those email addresses, call um, and, and ask us and we will share these with a wider audience as well. I yeah, hope cool. that, that made sense. Yeah. Yeah, for me, thanks again for your time, guys. We will send the materials out and look forward to having uh, any questions come in and looking forward to working with you. Just one last question just popped in there from an anonymous attendee from a I'll read it out. From a civil infrastructure perspective, has there been consideration into how this could help with decreasing risk in construction by allowing engineering stakeholders to access geodatabases in order to enable safer design? There is, it's, it's an interesting one. So um, CAD and GIS are starting to um, integrate and work a lot more together. Uh, so what it means is I, I think s can now open up Revit models. Um, so that means that you can actually um, view that data via the s interfaces. Now, similarly in, in the SAP roadmap, we've actually included the SAP, SAP HANA roadmap and HANA Space and Services roadmap in the slide stack. Um, there are some notes there on, on CAD as well. So that they, the we are also, SAP is also looking at bringing the, the kind of CAD models into the, into the place there. So that does mean that the CAD models and the, the kind of civil 
infrastructure um, models can be opened up with the tools um, yeah. and you know start using that. So just just from my perspective, that's a really good question. It comes back to that whole um, uh, underlying purpose of what we're talking about today: integrating data sets and applications from from different users, and uh, the other. So the SAP ESRI Alliance is, is one of the things we've spoken about today. Another uh, very similar alliance is the alliance between ESRI and Autodesk. And so that's been um, created. And again, it's a co-development strategy um, to support workflows, just like the one you're talking about there. We recognize that you know, having information and applications siloed um, uh, is an issue. And we want to break those barriers down and make that flow of information in case of, for example, the Matthews one, uh, making the information flow of Revit models or um, other um, BIM native data sets, make that flow into GIS really simple, but equally to do the same as we're talking about here, have that geo enabling of a number of the Autodesk products, um, whether it's uh, for infrastructure or for, for, the, for the BIM specific ones, and um, to support that too. So that's a really good um, question. Mm. There's, there's one more there on um, uh, does user's version of SAP impact the cap capability of S for HANA? Now, um, uh, it's, an, it's, it's an interesting question. So from a HANA perspective, there are ha different HANA versions and not, not all of them are spatially like. So you need to have a HANA enterprise or HANA standard with graph option to, um, to have spatial Cap um, spatial enabled in there and geo database capability in it. Um, however, um, SAP and ESRI can work together um, without HANA spatial, and uh, that's a side sidecar pattern we talked about. So, if you have ESRI in place there, then we can integrate the ESRI interfaces to the SAP S4 HANA products, um, regardless on what. Um, user licensing you have in place. So, so we're looking at in some customer, uh, customers, we're looking at runtime um, HANA licensing. Um, and then even though it's a runtime license, we can still, still integrate the ESRI capability into the interfaces exactly the same way. Because that happens on the UI level rather than on the um, data level. What, what it does mean though is that there will be more complexity around synchronization and things like that. So we do need to then share a little bit more data um, across the different systems to, to make it happen. Um, does Arc FM products also compatible to work inside HANA as part of S with Geo database? Um, so Arc FM uh, do you want to answer this, Scott, or shall I? Uh, so ArcFM uh, products are basically the, the utility network um, model in ESRI uh, is where the utilities are going. Um, so ArcFM is kind of the version before that, and the ArcFM side of the, the fence for, was built on the geometric network. Um, so... I don't think that will be included the same way in um, in the HANA as so. I don't, I'm not sure what the. I suppose what I'm saying is I'm not sure what the um, roadmap for ArcFM is. Yeah, we can take that one off offline. I uh, I don't sure who that user is. If you want to reach out, it's a very it's a specific question. There's two roadmaps which are um, coming together. We can share the timeframes for that if you want. Um, so if, if that user, whose name I don't recognize, wants to reach out, um, that would be cool. But I mean, the short answer is um, yes, um, but we can give more specifics on that um, if you want to reach out to uh, probably myself with the email address on the screen there. So Aaron, Aaron just raised his hand, so I'm allowing Aaron to talk. Uh, what did you want to say, Aaron? Go for it. Uh, it helps if I unmute you. So Aaron's one of our utilities team at uh, Eagle. Don't be hate it when... That doesn't quite let me do what I was... Oh. 
50 years combined experience with GIS and ERP. <laughs> yeah. web, webinar technology has definitely got the better of us today. Oh, uh, no, I don't see. I don't know how. Can you, Alex, Alex can you try, try if you can unmute Aaron? I'm just going to promote him. Hi, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey team, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Now. Ah, brilliant. All right, uh, technology challenges. Yeah. Okay, so I, I guess the ArcFM question comes around um, support for ArcFM Classic built on the Geometric Network. Um, so my uh, the compatibility matrix for the Geometric Network is not supported on HANA, but ArcFM, the ArcFM suite of products built on the Utility Network um, is actually, a, a, I guess, a productivity tool um, and set of applications that are kind of platform agnostic. Um, so I guess the, the, the ArcFM Classic product and the new ArcFM suite of products are actually built on different technologies. So I guess it comes down to um, what the question was um, uh, related to with uh, ArcFM Classic integration and SAP HANA or whether it's um, ArcFM on the utility network. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, no problem. I think that was the last. Yeah. So hopefully oh, yeah. that answered that question. Yeah, we've got another person interested in that question too. So hopefully that's answered it, but we can um, we can give more specifics on that if you wanted to uh, to reach out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time. And as we said, we will fire out the uh, presentation as a uh, slide pack. And uh, please reach out to us if you have any further questions, obviously, in addition to RKFM. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Bye.